Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for the Human Tech Speaker Series. I'm Stephen Lee, the Dean of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. FAS and Academic Affairs are the co-sponsors of the series, and this afternoon's talk with Sylvester Johnson. Thank you, Dr. LaCourse, for your commitment to the Speaker Series and to the liberal arts more broadly. I also want to thank Leslie Twitchell, Christina Merrill, Cherie Crenshaw, Annie Sorensen, William Holsworth, uh, and a whole bunch of other folks who have been helpful in trying to figure out logistics, whether that be with state travel or wherever. Uh, thank you all very much for your help. Uh, thank you also to Isaac Esplin and all of his team in IT for their help in recording today's talk. Way to go, Isaac. Thank you. All right, and now to our speaker. Sylvester Johnson is an award-winning scholar engaged in exploring humanity in the age of intelligent machines. He serves as the director of Virginia Tech's Center for the Humanities. He also serves associate vice provost for public interest technology. Dr. Johnson also is a professor at VTU's Department of Religion and Culture. Prior to joining VTU, Dr. Johnson served as an associate provost uh, I'm sorry, an associate pr professor of African American studies and religious studies at Northwestern University. There, much of his research focused on the intersection of religion, race, and colonialism. Dr. Johnson holds an MA and a PhD in contemporary religious thought from the Union Theological Seminary, where he also earned an MPhil in systematic theology. He earned his bachelor's degree in chemistry and education at Florida A&M University. He's a neat guy. <laughs> Dr. Johnson's compelling vision to infuse the intellectual life of the university with insights from the humanities is directly applicable to Utah Tech's new polytechnic mission. His work came to my attention uh, earlier this year as we prepared to host the Global Polytechnic Summit, uh, which we hosted here during June. When I contacted him about potentially serving as a keynote speaker for the Polytechnic Summit, I learned quickly that I had found a professional colleague with whom I shared many goals. More importantly, however, I found in Dr. Johnson a friend who shares my deep commitment to, the edu to education and to an engaged, informed citizenry, and an understanding uh, that only through innovative thinking can we hope to address the problems the world faces. I shared with Dr. Jonathan that UT's polytechnic mission is grounded in a human-centered approach to problem solving. That vision is deeply influenced by Virginia Tech's model of placing humanities at the center of tackling complex, rapidly changing problems. So during his visit here for the Polytechnic Summit, Dr. Johnson and I began exploring several opportunities to collaborate, including potentially partnering uh, around grant funding opportunities. Dr. Johnson is a unique bird in the academy, someone who's deeply committed to his ideals and who wants to collaborate across institutions. He and I agree completely that the moment of the humanities is not behind us, it's actually in front of us. Thank you, Sylvester, so much for making the long journey to Southwest Utah with your wife, Heather, and your son, Ray. I trust the Red Rock landscapes have sufficient wow to justify the trip. I appreciate your kindness and willingness to collaborate. I look forward to learning from you today and in the future. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sylvester Johnson. Thank you so much uh, for a very kind introduction, a very generous introduction. Uh, uh, Dean Stephen Lee of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, your, your uh, comments uh, really resonate with me, and I'm grateful for them, and really want to express my gratitude for being invited to come visit with you. I was invited in June, and I thank you for inviting me back. Most people, in my experience, I've not usually gotten invited again. You know, they say, oh, we're done with you. You know, you came once, so that was enough. 
Uh, so very generous of you. I've had a day filled with amazing, inspiring conversations with uh, so many stakeholders across this university. And so I thank all of you for the time that you devoted to, to sharing with me some of the fascinating work that you're leading here at Utah Tech. I wanted to thank as well uh, your president, President Williams, who uh, was kind enough to take time last night to speak with me over dinner about some of the work that you're doing and uh, Provost LaCours uh, taking time as well to uh, really listen to some of the things that have been on my mind and I'm eager to hear more from you of the vision that you're executing here for the future of our nation and our world. Uh, Leslie Twitchell, you have devoted so much time to uh, making sure that our experience here has been a, a great one. Uh, so we're really thankful for your attention to the detail, the nice, beautiful, welcoming gift in the hotel that you left for us, all of that, uh, the careful attention to the agenda, and, and all the work that has to go into arranging a visit like this. So I want to thank uh, all of you who took time today. Really grateful to have my wife, Heather Nicholson, uh, traveling with us and our son, Ray. Johnson Nicholson, who's with us, and, and yes, we've definitely gotten the wow factor from the beautiful, beautiful uh, geography of this place. It is just amazing. A little bit different from Virginia. We, we have mountains and hills there, but not, not like this, a uh, very different level. So all of you, I just want to let you know how deeply appreciative I am of this invitation. And so in the, the next several minutes, what I want to do is to talk about the future of talent and the Fourth Industrial Revolution um, as an opportunity to reflect on the innovation that is happening in the way the university works. Uh, much of that innovation is being envisioned and led right here at Utah Tech, and I'll be talking about the, the four points of your vision that you have structured in relationship to some of these changes within the context of a technological society. So what I want to do is to share some of my my own musings and reflections about the challenges that higher education is going to face and is already facing in the context of what's called the fourth industrial revolution or in industry 4.0 or the, the very, very complex uh, iterative changes that are happening uh, in technology, uh, both within sectors and across sectors, and what that means for the mission of our higher education institutions. And toward the end, I want to talk about how our institutions collectively might best respond to those changes in order to execute on a mission by reflecting particularly on what you're leading here at Utah Tech. Uh, one of the things that we, we well, before I do that, just a little bit, what is the Fourth Industrial Revolution? Because I have it in the title of this slide. And it, it simply refers to the transformative era that is being shaped by cutting edge technologies that are shaping not just one part of our society, not just the way some people are living their lives, but is transforming at a fundamental level how virtually all of us live and work. And if we think of examples of the, the advances in digital technologies and physical and biological systems tech uh, that's leading to very elevated expansive forms of automation and labor, of connectivity and communications, uh, data-driven decision-making. Uh, this, this nature of revolutionary shift is driving innovations such as AI, which we you probably haven't heard about recently in the news. <laughs> uh, of course, we have. It's all over the, the media in terms of the, the human side of these challenges that AI is presenting. The Internet of Things, 3D printing, advanced robotics or advanced manufacturing. These kinds of changes are creating greater efficiencies in labor systems and manufacturing. Uh, they're also affecting culture. They are changing human behavior. They affect various aspects of our lives. And all of this represents uh, the potential to revolutionize virtually every sector of our society. The revolutions, the changes that we are seeing are going to increasingly place a demand on higher ed to also respond to these changes through adaptation. And sometimes those adaptations, I think, might need to be rather uh, small in scale, and other times they might need to be rather drastic in scale. I'm going to talk about how we might respond to these in order to ensure a future 
uh, that is more humane and that elevates collective thriving and shared prosperity. So one example of the kinds of changes that we're seeing in the, uh, what might be called Industry 4.0 or this Industrial Revolution broadly conceived involves the shifts that are happening in genomics and the ability to implement new methodologies in what's known as precision medicine. So today, if you go to the drugstore and get some medication or if your doctor prescribes you some, some drug, that has been developed through cl clinical trials uh, that aims to have an effect on much of the population. And depending on the kind of drug or treatment that is being prescribed, which may be the people who are going to benefit for that, that method of intervention might constitute 40, 50 percent of the population. It just depends. And we know that this is not a perfect system. That doesn't mean that the pharmaceutical industry is a, is a fraud or a scam. Uh, these drugs and treatments save lives every day. They enable people by the millions to manage their lives dealing with all kinds of illnesses. But not everything works for everybody. Precision medicine is a genetically specific way to deliver treatment and, and medical therapy so that based on the individual person, what you're getting is 100% efficacy. So a drug could be designed based specifically on your DNA. It's going to work with you. It's going to be successful with you. And someone whose genetics is different, they get something that's a little bit different. In this case, what we've seen recently is one company, CRISPR Therapeutics, that has been running clinical trials of a genetic cure based on the CRISPR method which is, which is inserting you know, new DNA material into cells in order to change the function of those cells. In this case, uh, dealing with the creating changes in the bone marrow cells that produce red blood cells uh, to cure sickle cell anemia. So sickle cell anemia is a, a genetic illness in which a person's red blood cells are warped. They're shaped like a sickle, and those cells are not able to do what red blood cells are supposed to do. They're supposed to carry oxygen throughout your body. They don't do that very well. And they also uh, create obstructions in the blood vessels that in create massive pain and suffering for individuals. This treatment is a cure. And what happens is removing uh, bone marrow cells, genetically altering the DNA of those cells so that they will produce normal red blood cells putting those bone marrow cells that have now been genetically modified back into the body of that patient and allowing that patient then to regenerate red blood cells that would be healthy, normal red blood cells. And once that done, that's done, they don't need to come back for another treatment every three months. They don't need to take drugs for the rest of their lives to treat sickle cell anemia. It's gone. It's cured. And it is specific to that person. So. Now, that's been going in clinical trials. The FD, FDA, the Federal Food and Drug Administration, is currently reviewing the results of those clinical trials. And the expectation that CRISPR Therapeutics has is that by next month, by December, they'll receive FDA authorization to make this available to patients throughout the world. So this is already being done, and, and people have been cured in the clinical trials. That's the point. The cost, the cost is $3 million per patient. So that's a lot of money. But it is a cure. And what it means is that for the rest of that per person's life, they will not need to take drugs or go back and get medical treatment to deal with this disease. But it's not cheap. And these, the company is trying to recoup the expenses that they have had to incur in order to develop this, plus also generate a profit for that. And they're also trying to reflect what is the value of being able to be cured from this kind of disease. But $3 million per patient they expect insurance companies to pay, and the insurance companies are, are, are probably going to pay this in order for lives to be changed. So one point that I want to make is just the power to change someone's cellular information, their genetic information. And this is just one example. You can do this in theory could be done for all kinds of diseases, and, and treatment has been developed as well for diabetes, for example, to reprogram cells in order to, uh, to have a normal function to eradicate diabetes. It's also for cancer treatment. Your body will normally target cancerous cells. Those cancerous cells are your cells. It's your DNA if you incur cancer. And if you could supercharge your cells to make them better at targeting cancerous, cancerous cells, your body could actually cure itself of cancer. So that's actually been done with human cells, uh, that kind of thing. 
So this is one example of that. Another, so another thing that we're seeing in the context of the fourth industrial revolution of the, the massive changes that are happening is what could be called the grand challenge of all times. And I think that uh, the, the grand challenge of all times is rightly described as inequality, although there are lots of things up there. People have wisely pointed out, for example, that if we don't address successfully climate change, we won't even be around to experience inequality because we won't be able to live on this planet. So there is certainly a fierce competition for what's number one. But the point is that inequality is shaping the context for everything that we do, for every innovation that we're able to bring to fore, and all the consequences that will follow. And what we're seeing, as this image represents, is an unprecedented scale of juxtaposition between incredibly high wealth values and incredibly uh, widespread forms of poverty and suffering. And you're seeing those things together. The world is seeing more value creation than we've ever been able to imagine before, especially because of innovation. And we're also seeing greater disparity between haves and haves nots. Uh, most recently, the biggest valuation increases that we're seeing are in digital technology and within digital tech, within AI. I actually think the kinds of valuations that we're seeing, so we have trillion dollar companies now, uh, could, could easily be dwarfed by the valuations of biotech companies, such as CRISPR Therapeutics. Uh, and I just gave you an example. How much money has anyone, any individual consumer ever spent on an AI product? You probably haven't spent $3 million on an Apple Watch or an Apple phone or an Apple computer or your broadband service. But here we see $3 million a pop for one person to get treated for medical cures. What if you extrapolate that out? Uh, but the point is that globally, the rise in inequality is vastly shaping the context of the innovation. Because of innovation, we are seeing more wealth created than most people could have ever imagined. And we are seeing a greater concentration of wealth into fewer hands. So uh, USB is one company, uh, UBS, excuse me, is one company that has, has conducted studies of these wealth divides. And so this is taken from their 2023 report on global inequality. And what they've shown, this is a, a chart of household wealth distribution globally. And at the top of that chart is a very small black triangle. And at the very bottom of that chart, is a somewhat gray section of that triangle. So on your left side is the household wealth for each section of that triangle on the lowest tier in US dollars, about $10,000 in wealth. So that's not income, that's wealth. That's all your assets minus all your liabilities. You know, if you have 1,000 bucks in the bank and you have $500 worth of debt that you own your car, your, your wealth in that very simplified example is 500 bucks. So this is not income, this is wealth which is a, a more precise way of measuring equality and inequality. And what this shows is that at the very top, 1.1%, uh, the top 1.1% of people in the world, so that small black triangle there, which we have a net worth that exceeds $1 million. So that's millionaires, billionaires, et cetera. Control, they own 45% of all the wealth in the world. It's about 1%. One tier down, uh, the top 12% of people on almost 40% of the wealth. If you add those together, in other words, the top 13% of the wealthiest people in the world control 85% of the world's wealth. The other way, if you look at the very bottom, is uh, the about half of the world's population, 52.5%, share collectively 1% of the wealth in the world. In other words, if this entire room had 100 people in it, and the entire wealth of this room were $1, and we gave, and we took half the people in this room and gave them their share and said, well, you're the lower half. You're the bottom 50%. We would be giving them one penny out of that dollar. And the rest of us in this room would have the other 99 pennies of the dollar to ourselves. Another way of looking is that if we had 100 people in this room and the wealth in this room were $1, one person would own 45% of that dollar. 13 of us in the room would own 85 cents of the dollar. And the other 87 of us in the room would only have what's left. 
the other 15 cents, just to kind of give you a sense of that. This is, this is the trend that's continuing. And part of what's happening is that people are becoming wealthier than anyone could ever imagine. So I just told you we have trillion dollar companies. Had you in the 1990s gone into boardrooms of the greatest companies in the world or the greatest economic analysts in the world and said, one day we will see companies worth a trillion dollars or more, many experts would have laughed at you and said, ha, that's ridiculous. Companies can't be worth over a trillion dollars. Just the 1990s, that, that would have been the response. But here we are, we have multiple companies that are worth trillions of dollars. And what I'm saying is that we should get ready for a future in which companies will be worth tens of trillions of dollars. And that, and that value is in the hands of shareholders. And so we're seeing more wealth created than the world could have imagined previously. So that's, part, that's the, one of the biggest reasons why we're seeing the inequality. But we're also seeing more and more people who are being pushed out of the ability to participate in the productive labor economy. It's not just that they're not billionaires, it's that many families are living on less than $2 a day in the world. Okay? So inequality is not just a relative kind of phenomenon, it is an absolute kind of phenomenon. It is a reality in which there are millions of people throughout the world who have trouble having enough food every day or enough housing every day. And that's just trying to give you a sense of it. So we're creating a future in which there's going to be more wealth than ever before. And we're going to have more inequality than ever before. And that's like saying we're creating a future in which we will have more food than ever before. And more people will go hungry. <laughs> like that's, that's kind of what that's saying. So we have to figure out how are we going to respond to that situation. Another challenge that we're facing in, in this future that is going to affect higher ed is the way AI is able already to replace, we've seen this with the like after strikes, human labor, human actors, is challenging the future of creative work because one of the things that AI is really good at is coming up with things that looks like creativity. Now you can insist that machines are not capable of thinking or that they can't create things, that's fine. <laughs> but the whole point of generative AI is to generate something that didn't exist before. And AI can now generate text that didn't exist before, or images, or music that didn't exist before. And we can have a, a lively philosophical debate about whether that's really thinking, or whether that's really creativity. But while we're having that debate, we should understand that actors like Peter Cushing, who died decades ago, his image is on the right side of that slide, appeared in a film recently. Now, he's been dead for decades. How did he appear in a recent film? The film was Rogue One a Star Wars story? Well, because of AI that was able to take all the images of him in the past and map that onto a person who moved around and, and they could track the cameras could track the movement of the person, the human actor who's still alive. And then the AI just generated the image of this person who's been dead for decades, who was an actor in a recent film. You no longer need a living person to have film. So that's been done. But what's also being done is capturing people's bodies, scanning their bodies, capturing their voice, so one day, Steve, you don't even need to worry about flying me out here. You know, you just press the button and the generative AI does the talking, comes up with a great talk. The holography, the hologram, you know, can project me, and then I don't even need to get on the plane, and then I'm out of a job. <laughs> and then we expand that, right? That's, I'm saying that in a joking kind of way, but the reality is that what, what SAG-AFTRA labors uh, the union has been striking about, how can we guarantee the future of creative artists in the creative economy if we are already at a place where AI can replace them, where you can just scan people and then you don't need the humans anymore to make your film. And the people who own the content can continue to make film. But what happens to the human actors? Is there a such thing as a right to participate in the productive labor economy? I asked our, our students this in the recent class. That's a collaborative innovation course at Virginia Tech. And what I asked them is that I asked them what they wanted to do as careers. And so they, you know, they named different things. And I said, well, if you know, if we could do that with technology, with some machines and AI, robotics, or what have you, and everything you came up with, we could have something, a machine to do with maybe a couple of humans instead of thousands of you, would you feel OK? And I asked them, do you think you have a right to be able to participate in the productive labor economy? Or do you think it's a problem <laughs> if we actually exercise the ability to make you completely unnecessary to productivity. And it's, it's a scary idea. It's a startling idea because on the one hand, we should celebrate 
the kind of changes and benefits innovation brings. On the other hand, the kinds of concerns that these actors have been striking about could eventually be true of most people in the world, regardless of our professions. And it's certainly, it's certainly something that is, uh, is relevant to higher education and to the talent that's in higher ed. So another example. Uh, what's another challenge? I mean, you all know about this. If you work in higher ed, you know about what the so-called enrollment cliff. And that is back in 2008, there was a, a, a big recession. And one of the human behavioral responses to that recession is that people had fewer births, fewer children. And that was 2008, and you fast forward, okay, so if you say the average 18-year-old uh, is going to college, so if you uh, just go out 18 years past 2008, a year at 2026, and there's going to be a precipitous decline in the number of humans who are eligible to be students going into colleges and universities as quote-unquote traditional students. So that's called the enrollment cliff, and that's what you're seeing being charted out here, that by the time you get to 2026 and 2027, uh, the, the number of eligible people who can move into those higher ed institutions and be paying customers who are, delivering, who are paying tuition, sitting in classes, seeking degrees or what have you, is going to drop uh, by as many as 400,000 people by 2029 and decline further. So one of the, the other challenges for higher education is that uh, the basis for what we do is the humans who are going to experience the delivery of learning will become significantly fewer in number. And when you add to that the concerns about the skepticism that attends the value of a higher education, uh, we, we've seen this in recent years, particularly with the pandemic and lots of concerns about these experts who were trying to tell people what to do, uh, not recognizing, well, yeah, if, if you're seeking guidance, if you go to a doctor, if you go to your surgeon for what have you, you, you'd want an expert. You don't want Sylvester Johnson in there. You want to, as we used to joke you know, about being a real doctor versus a PhD, you know, but you'd want, you'd want a medical doctor. You don't want Sylvester Johnson who can give great humanities lectures. You want someone who's really skilled and knowledgeable and experienced in heart surgery or whatever the thing is, that we need expertise. But we have growing skepticism about it. We have growing hostility. We have growing sense of estrangement from our higher education institutions and now there are going to be fewer humans, in the, and this is, these numbers are based on the United States, this is the point I'll come back to in a moment, who are going to be eligible to even be students. And so how will our higher education institutions deal with that change in market? Uh, the, the last thing that I'll talk about as a challenge, and there are many, is that our higher, educa higher education institutions will also face a steep challenge in competition from educational technology Companies. In other words, you know, throughout my career, I've, I've enjoyed the, uh, the illusion that higher ed institutions are alone in the business of disseminating knowledge and information and credentialing people and preparing them with skills in education, et cetera. But the truth is that knowledge doesn't belong to any particular set of institutions. Knowledge is a human phenomenon, and it's not even just human. Your dog and your cat know all kinds of things, and dolphins have languages, et cetera, that, that it actually belongs to the world. And it would be dishonest with ourselves to think that only higher ed institutions can disseminate knowledge, can provide information, can have a business model that delivers education to people who want it and need it. In fact, what we're seeing now is an unprecedented ability of private companies to be able to reach out and deliver learning to people all over the world. And when you think about something like generative AI, which can switch to the language of the person who needs to know something, why not, why, why pay Sylvester Johnson to teach a humanities course? Why not just scan Sylvester Johnson, digitize his voice, but make it sound a little bit more like Denzel Washington or something. You know? I mean, I know I already do, but you could change it. And have it speak in whatever language the student needed. And have it available 24-7. And it's, and it's not just watching something on YouTube. You know, it's interactive. You get a one-on-one -on -one lesson with as many students in the AI, with that AI as possible. And one person is, is doing it in Spanish, and the other is in French, and the other is in Swahili. And the AI just moves to what they need, and it can answer questions in detail and give them examples and give them tutoring and prompt them. 
and never loses patience, and it never needs to sleep. Why not just do that? Why have Sylvester Johnson? So ed tech companies are already leveraging AI to deliver personalized, scalable education to people all over the world. That's already happening in 2023. That's already happening. What about 2033? And if you understand the business model of our education institutions, most of us like to teach during the times that most people are at work. Because, you know, like most humans, we'd like to go home at the end of the work day and go play with our kids and cook some dinner. But there is a huge demand of people who work jobs 8 to 5 or 9 to 5 or 7 to 7 during the day who would love to be able to have access to, to, to education. And one example that one university did, Purdue University, was to acquire a private company, Kaplan. And they named it Purdue Global. And it was online delivery. And it was synchronous and asynchronous. And it was designed for what they call the adult learner, people who have jobs, who are not going to quit their job to become full-time students, to be able to get access to information that they couldn't because the Sylvester Johnson professors of the world want to teach between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. on Tuesdays and Thursdays. <laughs> and then I'm done. You wonder where our students get it from? They get it from the faculty. And, and now those people can have access to learning. They can get a college degree or they can do something that's non-credit. But the point is that, if, and I gave you the example of a private company that got folded into a public university. And that, that's what Purdue University is. But the point is that private companies are increasingly in the business of delivering learning in a very scalable, nimble way. So how are higher education institutions going to respond to that challenge? Because the ability to do what they're doing is absolutely being enabled by the kinds of technological innovations that are happening and by the demand for upskilling and reskilling that an industry 4.0 technological society has to have. The skills demanded keep changing. The knowledge needed keeps changing. Just think about all the people who on this day, November the 6th, 2022, had never heard of prompt engineering. Never heard of it. And now you have people whose job <laughs> is called prompt engineering. And I see the heads nodding. That, that means you've heard of it, <laughs> you, that, you, that you can type or speak to an AI and get it to do something because you're really good at asking it the questions in a way so that it can generate what you need. Right? So that's just one, that's less than a year. What about a decade? What's going to happen? What's going to change? So when we think about these changes, it can seem very intimidating. But the good news is, is that there are the Utah, the Utah techs of the world, and there are very few uh, doing what you're doing, that I think have a compelling way of envisioning a thriving future, not in spite of these changes, but especially in synchronicity with these changes, in concert with these changes. That Utah Tech has developed a vision, the plan and execution for being an open university that admits everyone who wants to be a student can actually be a student. An inclusive university that is a welcoming place for everyone to come and to be a learner, to be a worker, to be a participant. A comprehensive university because for the past 75 years, since Sputnik, since the US got into the business of the space race, since we began to incentivize mostly STEM or only STEM, and have begun to do that even more aggressively, I don't need to tell you the examples if you're, you're following the, the news articles about humanities. Every month or so, there's a new article about the decline of the humanities. Or there's always another story of a university that is cutting humanities courses. That's been. 75 years in the making. And here is a university, Utah Tech, that says, you know what? We're actually, we're becoming comprehensive. We're not getting rid of comprehensive. We're becoming comprehensive as our vision for the future and polytechnic. The engagement and partnership in a collaborative, full spectrum collaborative way with private industry. Those elements of the vision actually position this university in any institution that wants to commit to this kind of path of leaning into the future. It positions this university to be able to thrive in concert with those changes. And so I want to reflect 
uh, in the next few minutes before I end on why I believe that's the case and how that can happen in many ways. It is no secret that workforce development has become the number one concern of many local governments, economies, state governments, and entire nation states around the globe. And workforce development meaning how are we going to, one, get more humans to participate in the productive labor economy? Two, how are we going to deliver the skills and knowledge that people need in an industry 4.0 world where prompt engineering never existed 12 months ago, and now people are making six-figure salaries being prompt engineers? <laughs> How'd they learn that so fast? I'll tell you what they didn't do. They didn't go get a four-year degree in prompt engineering because it's only been 11 months and two weeks. See, <laughs> there wasn't time for that. So how did they do this? Someone had to deliver something quickly enough. There had to be another way of doing it. Workforce development is we need more people in the pipeline, in the talent pipeline. We need a, a more robust way to deliver the learning and the skills and the knowledge so that they can not only participate but, but continue to participate that it's gotta be lifelong learning. It can't be, okay, we're gonna upskill you one time. It's a one and done. It's like, no. <laughs> what happens when the next kind of Gen AI things comes out, when the next example of a prompt engineering kind of thing comes out, how are we gonna do that? So workforce development would thrive through partnerships with private industry, polytechnic universities that are executing a robust relationship in a 360 degree fashion with private industry are gonna be in the position to thrive in this environment. When I say 360 degree, what I mean is you're not just interested in talking to private employers uh, to see if they can hire your students or give them internships. That's very important. We absolutely have to go out and support the ability of our students to be able to get jobs to participate, to participate and thrive in the productive labor economy. And we also need to do other things, which you're doing. Working closely with private industry in shaping curriculum figuring out how we're gonna create the kinds of transformative learning experiences that come well before a student even graduates. How are we going to get more people involved in ways that might, it might not be a degree program. In fact, it could be something that's not even for credit. The learning has to be studio-based. It has to be more hands-on. It can't only be Sylvester Johnson giving a 50-minute lecture, and you know, that's, that's one important way, but that's not the only way to teach. It's not the only way to learn is not even the most compelling way. We also need to provide other more active ways of learning. We need industry experts and academic instructors to get in that studio together, together. It's not the way I learned when I was in graduate school. No one said, well, Sylvester, you know, you need to get ready for the day when you're gonna be in, the, in a studio with, with an engineer and, and you're a humanities person. But guess what? For the past four and a half years, Sylvester Johnson has been in a studio with an engineer and it's been transformative not just for our students, but for Sylvester Johnson. But workforce development in partnership requires that kind of thing. We need teams of students working on real problems together so that that problem-based learning can prepare them to do the kinds of things that anyone has to do for a job. You have jobs, you know what you do. You don't go and, and sit down with other people who have, who, only who have the same degree that you have. You work with all kinds of people because you're trying to get something done, and we need to be able to get our students to do that. We also need to remember that the narrative that we are hearing, that, ad, that enrollment managers, that admissions experts are highly skilled in understanding and preparing for, that the enrollment cliff is coming. We need, to get, we need to understand that that narrative has certain assumptions built into it. What it assumes is that your only hope of delivering education to people is locked up inside of the boundaries and borders of a nation state. And that has never been true. Higher education has had all kinds of problems. We know what they are. We didn't allow people to come based on all kinds of things, their gender or their race or, or their ethnicity or what have you, issues of, of, of ableism, all kinds of issues. But one thing that's been true of higher ed for hundreds of years is that it has never been locked up inside of national boundaries. It's always been transnational. The talent has been transnational. The way intellectuals learn has been around the world where they read other languages or they read people, even if they didn't like their people if they were reading another, they still read their work in other languages. And that the market, the students came from all over the place. And we know that's true. We have international students 
that's our category, that's what we call it in higher ed, from all over the world, coming to our institutions. So it's never been controlled by national boundaries. But what this narrative assumes is that while the US market is the main thing, the reality is that the whole world is out there. On the right side of this slide is a circle. It's called the Dowry Purist Circle. Inside of that circle are more than half of all the humans in the world. Think about that. Think about that. More than half of all the people live in the, who live on our planet live within that circle on the right. In the middle of that slide is the continent of Africa. By the year 2050, so within about a quarter of a century, one of every four humans on the planet will be an African person. Africa, that continent, the nations of that continent, will have the highest concentration of future talent. The greatest population of students in the world by 2050 are going to live right there. The greatest population of students who are already in the world <laughs> are in that circle on the right. Where are most of the universities in the world? Everywhere else. Most of them are in North America and Western Europe. Most of our universities are in the West. Most of our students are everywhere else. And if we remember what has always been true, of higher ed, that higher education institutions have never been controlled by national borders. That's never happened. Then we can imagine this future not as an enrollment cliff, but as an invitation to elevate our mission to deliver learning to humanity. That is a global mission. That has always been how higher ed works. But the way that we execute that has to look different in this future. Instead of expecting people to fly and leave their continent and come to this country, we actually have to go to them. We have to deliver learning to where people are. The innovation, the technology, is going to make that easier than most people have ever imagined. The question is, are we going to be imaginative enough to meet this challenge? I'll give you one example of this. I was talking. I was talking to someone just last week about one of these African nations, Benin, which is funding the upskilling, not of 100 students, not of 1,000 students, but of 1 million students in the next few years. They're going to fund the upskilling. They have funding for it. The government's providing it. They're getting investment from the EU, from the World Bank. The only thing they need, you know what they need? They need partners. That's all they need. They need educational institutions who will say, you can pay us to teach the people who want to learn to participate in a productive labor economy. That's all they need. That's the bottleneck. We're going to see that kind of demand increase exponentially in the coming years. And finally, and I end here, comprehensive education is becoming more urgent and more essential than ever before. The beautiful thing about Industry 4.0 about this very complex world in which the innovation economy is iterating more quickly than most of us can imagine, and new job titles are coming up faster than most, most of us can keep up with, and more opportunities are existing for people to get ac access to fill in blank. The beautiful thing about it is that it makes no sense to say the only thing we need is math majors, or the only thing we need is engineers, or the only thing we need is STEM majors. It makes no sense to say that. What this future is showing very clearly, and our present, is that we have never had a more urgent demand than now for comprehensive education, for creativity, for the arts, for social sciences, for the STEM disciplines, technology and engineering and math and science, for those things together. We have never had a more urgent demand for our students to be able to learn across those boundaries. We've never had a greater demand for our faculty to teach as teams in order to get our students to work as teams, to understand the complex challenges. Companies are trying to prepare to colonize Mars. And you can, you know, you can say what you want to say about that. So why are they leaving? We haven't even you know, we're going to mess up one planet and leave and go to another one, and you might think, or you might think it's a great idea because you want to get away from your in-laws and, you know, maybe you want the next ship to Mars. But the point is that that's actually a very complicated problem. 
You know one of the hardest problems that space travel involves? It's not jet propulsion. It's not how do you eat and swallow dried food. You know one of the hardest problems is? Is getting 10 people in something as small as a, as a, as a, as a compact car and riding the equivalent of distance from the Atlantic coast to the Pacific coast at 10 miles per hour and not getting into a fight. And nobody dies because somebody just <laughs> got too frustrated. That's actually one of the hardest problems. How it's human behavior, how do you get people to be together under that kind of pressure for that length of time to do interstellar travel. How do you do it? There are other complex problems. How do you manage the ability of creative artists? I had the wonderful opportunity to spend time at your innovation plaza and, and to sit at the feet of the amazing people, the amazing humans who are there, some of you who are here now, and talking about the, the, uh, the intricate way that new business models are being developed, new possibilities are being of being birthed and new imagination are being nurtured in order to solve really, really difficult problems. And the first thing is obvious is that people are doing it together and that it takes different kinds of skills and talent and that you can't just have a major and say, you know, well, I'm, I'm the chemist, so I'm going to run this joint and the rest of you can just sit down and be quiet or I know how to write code and the rest of you just be quiet and do what I say. There are so many elements that are involved in making something like that work. And what we have to do is unleash the curiosity of our learners across those different areas so that when you get ready to solve a complicated problem, you recognize that you have to have people who are really good at cultural things, at human behavior. You need people who know how to think outside of a box. You have cultivated the higher learning skills such as curiosity. But what department do you go in to learn to be curious? Well, that's not a department, it's not a discipline. That's a human level skill that transcends any of these boxes that we've come up with. There has never been a more urgent time to be comprehensive. And the beautiful thing about our moment, about our time that I find inspiring, uh, and why I've been so excited to to be in conversation with you at Utah Tech is that you have the commitment, the values, and the vision, and the execution. I think that our world is going to need to thrive in that future. As we're trying to invest in the future of the talent that will have to solve very difficult problems, that will have to figure out how do you grow more food than the world ever imagined and have more people going hungry than ever before in history. <laughs> like that, that, because right now that's, that's what we're set for, is food insecurity. And that should not be our future, and it need not be our future. But you had better have future talent that teaches empathy, that teaches understanding, that exposes people to the bigness of our world that is not just my town that Sylvester grew up in, but there's a whole planet out there. And I think that these core principles of being open, inclusive, comprehensive, and polytechnic are the right formula at the right time to ensure that as we prepare the future of talent for an innovation economy, that we don't have to have a zero-sum way of thinking about the future of higher education that higher education can thrive, not in spite of, but in concert with the kinds of changes and opportunities that we're going to have if we choose to govern them in a way that is going to get us collectively shared prosperity and shared thriving. I want to thank you for the invitation to be with you today, and I uh, want to welcome your comments, uh, not just questions that you might have. Thank you again.
So kind of putting all of these pieces that you had together, you talked a little bit about the economics of, first of all, availability to resources, and then you were talking about education. So I was wondering, how does the economics fit into um, the availability of this education? And then as we make this more team building and more productive, in order to compete with these outside sources of, of education, will the value of what we're, I mean, we're creating more value in what we're doing, but will the cost have to decrease based on other outside sources? So what is kind of the economic outlook of, of all of this that you presented? Yeah, thank you for your question because it's, uh, you're, and I'm gonna repeat that question for the sake of our remote participants. And the question is, what is to be said about the economics of this future in which uh, educational tech companies are increasingly able to compete with colleges and universities are, that are more legacy institutions? And particularly if you think about the cost of education, doesn't it mean that the cost of education would need to decrease so that learning is accessible to more people? And if the cost is increasing, and so now I'm going to, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, try to interpret a little bit of what's there. If the cost is increasing, meaning if universities and colleges are charging less money, how are you delivering more for less? Right? Yeah, that's a very important question. So I want, I'll go back to the food example. We're going we're gonna to produce more food than the world has ever imagined. And more people will starve. You know, if someone says that to you, you, uh, you think, well, that doesn't make any sense. How are more people starving if there's more food? We're going to create more value, more GDP than the world ever imagined. I mean, back, back in 2017, PricewaterhouseCooper, um, in, they anticipated that the world would see between 2020 and 2030 anywhere from 90 to 100 trillion dollars in, in, I'd say new GDP, even though if you know GDP, that's redundant, but in new value creation in about a 12 year period. Now that was before the pandemic hit. And my point is that that could be way up, that could be off by 80% and it should still be gobsmacking. I mean, that, that just, if you understand it, because the total amount of GDP globally in the world at that time was only about 80 trillion dollars. And that's more GDP than had been produced in almost all of human history. If you chart the history of, GD, of value creation, of, of creation of wealth, if you chart it out between the beginning of human inhabitants and today, you, you wouldn't even, nothing would show up on that chart until you got to the 20th century. And it isn't that it isn't there. It's there. It's just by the time you chart it out, you have to show what happened after the 1920s. And, and to put it there, it shrinks everything else down to something that you can barely see. In other words, most of that value got in human history got created just within the past century or so. And in the next decade or two or three, we're going to create more wealth than we've created in, in almost all of human history. Just think about that, okay? Now, even if that's off by 50%, it doesn't change the point. And the point is that there will be no shortage of value of capital. There will be no shortage of wealth to solve the problems of the world. And some people's reaction to this is, well, we've got to stop all this wealth creation because money's bad. And my response to this is, if you could harness, if as a society, we would harness that wealth. And if we had just 1% of 100 trillion, and we use it to solve some of these problems, and do the other things that we, because they're also non-financial things that you need to do to solve problems, how much of human suffering could we solve? How many problems could we eliminate? In other words, if we start to think about this as an opportunity, sure we should have more wealth creation. And we need to use some of this wealth to solve some of these problems. So there is no amount, there is no shortage of money in the world to pay for higher ed. And I will give you one example of something that, that companies have done for a long time. So one, one way to answer your question is, who pays for the learning? And in our traditional model, the answer is who? The student, right? The student pays, or their parents, right? You know, same thing, the student. And historically, that's, that's never been always the case. 
because we know that people have been able to have their companies to pay for them to do a course or to do a degree. That's not a new idea. It's not a new idea. Companies already pay for upskilling. They already pay for reskilling. And the largest of these companies aren't, aren't paying for a degree from Sylvester Johnson University. They're paying for a company credential. Sylvester Johnson is an employee of company, I used to say company X, but now there is a company called company X. So I, I can't say company X anymore. Uh, company Z, you know, Sylvester works at company Z and wants to get up skilled to, do, to be a prompt engineer and so the, the company pays for him to go learn to do that. Because the company knows that well, if he can learn to do this, who gets the benefit? The company gets the benefit. We're gonna become more efficient. He's gonna be a better worker. We'll be happy to pay whatever. So that needs to be scaled out. We need to explore more opportunities for for companies, especially companies that are going to benefit tremendously from some of this wealth creation, to invest in their human talent. That's just one thing. That's not the answer to the whole thing. But my point is that there, there, are, there is no shortage of capital. The only thing that's in limited supply, I'll, I'll name at least a couple of them, our imagination and our political will. But, but what we will not be able to say as a society is that, well, you know what? We need it to deliver more learning. There was greater need, and my goodness, I tell you, we just couldn't afford it as a society. That will not be true. And I'll, I'll go back to Benin. I just talked to someone who's trying to find universities. They, they have money. All they want is for universities to say, we will take your money. You can pay us to help upskill the one million human beings who you want in your society to be able to participate. You can pay us and we will deliver that value. They have money, all they need is partners. That's just one example. So um, <clears throat> this notion of, of, of moving learning into the, um, to the private space and, and, and companies and so forth and using technology to deliver to the masses. So, so we had a great example of that over the last 10 or 15 years here in the idea of a MOOC, right? And so you, you've captured the knowledge of the best thinkers in the world from the best universities in the world and you deliver that at an extremely low cost to an unlimited number of people, potentially, right? And so, uh, and at first there's the buzz, the hype around this, it's gonna change everything, but it's pretty much failed. So, so it, it failed, I have certainly have some thoughts, but I'm curious about what your thoughts are, but if, if that failed, why is AI gonna succeed? And, and if, if, if the, the basic premise is that that doesn't work by itself, just access to knowledge, then what is the value of the university? What, what can we provide as an institution that bridges the gap between the easy access to knowledge and actual learning of that knowledge? Yeah, that's a, such a great question. I'd love to hear your sense of why you thought that failed because you're right. There was, there was lots of expectation that MOOCs were gonna transform everything and some people even felt like, well, we're not gonna need traditional universities anymore. But you're right, that's not how it materialized. But I'd love to hear your, your thoughts. <laughs> you, you, don't, you don't have to, but... but well, you know, well I mean, I, I, I think that, that learning is not just about access to knowledge. There's a piece of motivation and, and structure and, and so forth that, that given, given our, our ability to do anything we want on, any, you know, on a daily basis, we deal with our basic needs before we start worrying about And so, so it doesn't become a priority, and, and if there's no constraints to that. You know, I'll learn what I want, and if I don't have time, I'm not going to learn. And so people enter... I mean, I got into one one time, and I lasted like one class, two classes, and I had something else to do, and I never did any more. And I think that happens pretty frequently. So, so that there is a value for a university in in that world. I'm just curious Absolutely. what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, no, this is a terrific question, and and I think the, this is why I, I think we should be excited about this future, and not we we need to attend to the narratives about the enrollment cliff because there is a cliff if you focus narrowly. But there's not a cliff if you open up the purview. Uh, but look at these things as opportunities. So I think one of the reasons why the, the MOOC failed is that people, regardless of where they are, 
what their job is or what their status is. People are humans. And humans have evolved this incredibly powerful desire to be with other humans. And to different degrees. You know, some of us are introverts, other extroverts. Some of us need lots of alone time. Sure. But very few humans would be happy living on an island by themselves and having no human contact. That'd be highly unusual. We thrive on human interaction. And, and we found this out, if we didn't know it before, during the pandemic, when a lot of us got tired of sitting at home in our pajamas 24-7 and longed to be around some other humans. So uh, I think one of, the, one of the promising things is blending the experience of accessing information with the personal interaction and thinking creatively about how can we do both of those things. So I, what I'm about to say is not meant in the spirit of we've solved the problem, but in the sense of we're experimenting with something at Virginia Tech that I think is, is emblematic of this tendency that human beings have to want to spend time in community as learners. So we, we've created, um, what we think may be the, the first executive program in humanities. And if you know, and I think we, we learned of another one, I think today, uh, that another place, Wesleyan, uh, is, is doing that I think gets at the same thing, which I'm really excited to hear. But the point is that this is a, a non-credit one-year program in humanities that is being pitched to mid to sen senior level leaders in technology companies. They want to study humanities. They're not studying technology. <laughs> They're leaders. And we, what we've said is that we believe that humanities cultivates those higher level skills that leadership requires, higher level, higher level. And we brought them to campus for two days. It's an executive program. You know, they can't, they're not going to quit their jobs. They come in, they do a lot of things remotely, and then they come in again. So when it was three in person, uh, time periods when they come and they meet one another and they connect. And I will tell you, this is not a surprise. If you just understand human behavior, in 48 hours, they connected very closely. And now they've started doing the modules. And when you put together the human interaction and the human connection with learning together, it doesn't feel like you're sitting at your computer by yourself reading something online and maybe I'll go wash some dishes or I need to get the car washed, or I think I'll just go to the beach with my kids instead of sitting here in front of my screen time. It's, yeah, I'm reading this, but so are those other 12 people who are in this, and we're going to get to talk about it together, and we might talk about it online, but I'm going to see them in person in three more months, and it is that experience. of community. So one of the great values that, that is part of the quote-unquote traditional element of colleges and universities is captured in the residential experience. I'm not saying that everyone needs to quit their jobs and then live on a campus for nine months out of the year. It doesn't need to be nine months. But you can still create ways for people to experience human community. Humans learn at their best in community, broadly defined. That community could be with one other person. It could be with 50 other people. But when you put those things together, I think you have captured something that our traditional higher ed institutions have practiced for a long time, and that is the residential experience. But it can be scaled, it can be hybridized, it can be offered in more than one way so that people can have different opportunities to have access to it. Some people might, they, they can do the nine month thing a year because, you know, maybe they're living with their parents and they don't have to do something else for nine months. And other people, they're, they're, they just can't do that. But they would love to spend a weekend with other learners X number of times per year. But the point is that you're right. The MOOC failed for multiple reasons. I think one of them, probably the most important, was the absence of community. And that's something that private companies by themselves currently are not offering, that universities can't. So the other thing that I would say is instead of looking at these private companies as merely competition, we have an opportunity to partner with those institutions because those companies can often focus a lot of energy on developing algorithmic platforms that can make possible a scalable, personalized learning experience 
which means our universities don't have to come up with those things by themselves. What these companies are not good at is what colleges and universities have been doing for a very, very long time, and that is figuring out how you create a pedagogical experience that is a 360 experience. But we can do partnerships. Instead of seeing everything as a threat, we can look for the opportunities. Uh, so thank you for that question. It's a very important one. Um, thanks for a great talk, and thanks for your enthusiasm about our institution. I guess in your talk, you alluded to rising skepticism about experts and expertise, but I guess I wondered if you could talk about, along with um, AI and the enrollment cliff, the threat to universities from the, I guess, the skepticism about universities in general, the idea that universities have become, um, I guess, leftist ivory towers, indoctrination machines, and stuff like that. It seems like that's kind of a threat, and I wondered if you had any thoughts. Is it just a matter of scapegoating? Is it a matter of public relations? What would you suggest doing? Because it seems like it is, to some degree, a threat to universities to be cast as you know, the one of two opposites in, in kind of a political game. Thank you. Uh, a very important question as well. I'll repeat for the sake of our remote participants, and that is uh, the question is about the, the threats that higher ed is facing by being uh, caricatured as merely indoctrinating students instead of fostering learning among students. And this is a politically charged phenomenon that has, that has become quite mainstream and that institutions across the board are having to face. So yeah, it's a very important question. And so the, the question is how, what's the strategy? What should happen in order to deal with that? Uh, so, you know, of course, obviously, multiple strategies. One of them, I think, very important. It's, fortunately, it's, it's actually not true <laughs> that higher ed, if, if higher ed institutions were really taking students and strapping them to chairs and making them uh, swear an oath of allegiance or something or saying, now, this is what you must believe to cite out to me, then we'd have a problem on our hands because, you know, it's really going on. It'd be tough to respond to the criticism. Uh, the, the good news is that that's actually a fiction. That, that universities are actually places where people encounter all kinds of ideas. And, and it's not like, well, I'm the biology professor. Uh, I'm, I'm going to throw out the science textbook and just pick up anything willy-nilly and teach. I, I should still have to teach the science curriculum. Uh, but, that, but that's not indoctrination. That's, you know, that's science and evidence and methodology. But that students are able to come and experience lots of ideas, encounter evidence, and figure out how to do these things. So I think messaging is one. Um, academic institutions, we, we have, and this is generalized, and we have value talking to one another. We're great at arranging conferences and symposia, and we have established journals of peer-reviewed research, and we aspire to get published in Nature Magazine, or whatever, I mean, not magazine, Nature Journal, the Journal of Nature. And we don't have a mass media strategy. We don't own a mass media company together, we don't, or individually for that matter. We don't have the instrumentation and the, the architecture of apparatus to communicate to millions of people. And I think that we need to take advantage of the opportunity to do so. It has never been easier, and it's still hard but it has never been more feasible for anyone, and that includes academic institutions, to participate in the level of mass media and communicate. And I don't just mean a podcast. You know, I have a podcast at Virginia Tech, but it does not have millions of followers. If I could get Beyonce on there, I'm sure that would change. <laughs> but, but it has to be more than sure. We have a digital means of transmitting what we do. It's also how we convene and how we attract people to participate in what we're saying. So I think, I think we need a mass media strategy so that more people understand, oh, this is what they're doing. Oh, this is what they're saying. Because mass media is out there repeating this false message that we're just indoctrinating people, and it's not true. But, but that is what most people are hearing. Uh, the second thing, I think, is, is really elevating some of the 
some of the ways that the work that we do as experts is actually really essential. And, and I was sort of joking about the medical doctor thing, that there are, you know, there are ways to just make that more legible to people, that expertise is absolutely needed and necessary. And, and also, that doesn't mean that an expert is always right. No one is always right, but they're usually going to be right because they have the expertise mm -hmm. in comparison to a random person who is not an expert in that area. And I think that we have to do better as a society civically at, at uh, celebrating the value of the kind of work that at its best academic institutions do. In other words, we're very good at, at a mass cultural level um, celebrating, fill in the blank. You know, it could be the military, it could be sports, athletics, it could be uh, being uh, a, a, in, a, in a kind of professional sense, you know, um, a, a successful person. But when it comes to, if, if you ask, who are the top three scientists in the United States? Most people have never heard of them. But if I ask you, who are the top hip-hop artists? Or who are the top NFL players? Like, most people could tell you. And, and I think we can do a much better job of just staging, of celebrating, of elevating the kind of work that is very important to the academic enterprise at a mass level. And we need help with that. I think we want uh, to, to uh, contract with the services of people who work in mass media to do that. But I do think we, we need to do that. I think it's an opportunity because we, we do need to change minds so that people have a clearer understanding of what actually happens. So just to follow up on that, how can we make academic, peer-reviewed, juried information more available when it's consistently behind paywalls that are not accessible to the average citizen of the world? That's a great question. Um, yeah, so it's all about the business model. You know, open access is actually a, one of the most important areas of innovation in publishing. And uh, as, as one of the directors of an academic press told me almost 20 years ago, he said, open access is not a moral issue, it's a business model issue. That people often think about it as, you know, everyone should have a right to this information. And as a publisher, he said, absolutely. And we have employees who are copy editors and who maintain our digital platforms and they figure out how to aggregate content and they're paid. <laughs> you know, they're not enslaved to their labor. These are people who are paid for their labor. And there has to be a business model to make sure they get paid. So what we are seeing now is, uh, is successful business models to make that possible. And that, that's happening with the, the Greuter publishers. Uh, they're doing this. Elsevier has done, they actually support some open access. And they're, they're a for-profit company that, that's a big aggregator of academic content. Um, uh, JSTOR is, has increasing, which is provisioned by the company Ithaca. Uh, is increasingly make a, making a lot of content available and not behind the paywall, you know, not at cost, and that has depended on restructuring the business model. If you if you understand some of the things that go on in academic publishing, and I'll just give you a quick a quick example. You know, I'm a humanities person, even though I'm you know, transdisciplinary, and, and that's not defined in opposition to STEM. I, I'm very interested in science and technology, and am, identify as a technologist. Uh, but I edited a STEM, I edited, I wish I edited a STEM journal, I edited a humanities journal. And our journal, institutional subscription costs uh, 200 bucks a year. Science, science journal costs thousands of dollars, as much as $20,000 a year, for one, for one journal. One journal. And if you think about the fact that Scientific publications often have subventions, meaning if you're if you're a scientist, you're publishing research, uh, you typically have to pay the publisher of the journal thousands of dollars just to publish your article. That's if they accept it. If they accept it, that means you're you're now invited to pay them thousands of dollars <laughs> so they can publish your article. So they're getting paid thousands of dollars per article to publish, and then they turn around and charge ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars a year for the subscription. In my humanities journal, we've never paid an author to publish anything. And the subscription is only 200 bucks a year. 
So clearly there's a lot of room for innovation in that business model. And that's where the open access is coming, where a lot of you know, universities are already subventing, in other words. Then they're turning around and paying for the subscription. But what if instead you just took a fraction of that money and paid it to a publisher to make everything freely available? So that's how open access is happening. It is getting solved. And it's getting solved not as quickly as it should be. But it is getting solved. And I, and I do think that in the next decade, uh, we'll, we'll have a much more mainstream experience of having, you have to have a business model. So there's a business model. Uh, and the paying has to happen. But for the readers, they don't have to do the paying. They can just do the reading. I think there was a question. Was there a question in the back? I was going to ask you, uh, what are the challenges to constructing a comprehensive curriculum? And what do you think the pros and cons are of either approach, which is maybe like a more abrupt and now approach? and maybe like a trailblazing approach, like you, you were saying, maybe opening up whole programs for uh, AI and things like that, or do you think we should do a slow and like integrative approach to utilizing generative AI? Thanks for that. So another great question. How do, we, how do we integrate these technologies? So for the sake of our remote listeners, uh, what's, what are the pros and cons of opening up the learning strategies and learning practices and curricula to uh, technologies such as generative AI and other forms of AI. And I think if I understand the spirit of your question correctly, more broadly to any kind of innovation, should that be done all at once? Should it be done more slowly? And what are the consequences of each? Really it's a whip, uh, terrific question and, uh, and thoughtfully offered. And I think the, there would need to be some of both, or some of each. So some things should, should happen quickly because it can be done fairly simply, and other things might take much longer to implement. Um, we, we certainly need different kinds of pathways and on-ramps for learners to get access to education and for individual instructors, teachers, and institutions to deliver it. It's not that everyone has to do the same thing. You know, some, some institutions are probably going to, not probably, or definitely going to be much more um, attuned to in-person delivery of learning with some access to online to supplement that. And they may have larger faculties and a lot more residential. And other institutions might, might not even have a physical campus. They might employ people who can travel somewhere in the world to deliver, and it could be a team, a faculty, and they're going to go somewhere in the world, and they're going to live there for two years, and they're going to deliver knowledge, information, education. It may be for credit. It might be non-credit, but it will be what those people need at that time in order to get them access, and they're doing it without a campus, and, and maybe they're using a lot of AI. And other people are not going to be interested. If, if you've ever tried to help someone, an extended family member, do something like remote deposit or get access to their electronically or, or just change, access their online account, and their password management strategy is the, the yellow sticky on their computer screen that says, my password is password. And if you've ever tried to help them, to, you know that adding technology to things can often destroy the experience. And what we need is analog versions of things. Um, you know, prison education, making, making learning accessible to incarcerated students is going to be so important for many reasons. One, just for people who are, who are human beings to be able to access learning for the sake of learning. Two, most people who are incarcerated are going to be returning citizens to our society and need to be able to participate with skills and knowledge. Uh, but in those prisons, it's really hard to use technology because it's a prison. <laughs> it's designed to make it hard to get access to things. It's kind of another example. Maybe you need more analog, or maybe you need to mix it up. 
So it's going to depend. We need, we need flexibility. We need different kinds of options. And we need to keep in mind that there are a lot of nimble, fast-moving outfits that I'm calling ed tech companies. And I don't mean that in a sinister way. I mean that in a, in a oppor opportunity kind of way, that this is part of how the world is changing. And we're part of that world. And how do we think about the changes in line with a strategy that allows for lots of thriving to go on? And, and they're moving fast. Okay? And maybe they're moving too fast. But, but we have, that's why we need multiple approaches. We need the ability to do some things that integrate generative AI quickly, uh, especially, for example, if you have adult learners. Those adult learners are probably going to work being required to use what? Gen AI. Because their boss is telling them, this is how we're going to be more productive. <laughs> you know, we're going to elevate our productivity about 37% because now we're using this suite of products that has Gen AI in it. So they, they have to use it at work. Then they come to class, and the last thing they need is Professor Sylvester Johnson telling them that they're not allowed to use Gen AI in that class. I should be helping them to understand how they're going to make use of this technology. Not to cheat on the exam, but to enhance their ability to deliver value as a human in this world. And so uh, we need to be flexible. We need multiple options. And some of it will need to be faster. And some of it will need to preserve more analog or more traditional methods. I uh, was going to ask a question, but I'm not going to. <laughs> Instead, I'm going to point out that Michael from Book Bungalow is over here with books associated with Sylvester's non-technology publishing. <laughs> That's right. Uh, and could you please join me in thanking Sylvester Johnson?